Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival and explore a Canadian Geographic podcast. We're doing double duty here during the COVID era in this interview of Wade Davis, who is the author of uh, just a beautiful book, Madalena, River of Dreams. And uh, Wade Davis, welcome to the Ottawa International Writers Festival. And uh, Well, thanks for having me. Great to be back. Um, well, it's great to have you here. And uh, I, would, I would encourage people to go out and get this book because uh, it was really uh, just beautifully written. Uh, and really, it's an incredible tale about a country I think it's really very misunderstood. Um, in much of the world. Um, I, I just want to tell people about Wade, um, uh, who don't know his work. Uh, he is, I think, one of the great explorers of our generation. Uh, he is the best-selling author of multiple books, including uh, Serpent in the Rainbow, a fascinating look into voodoo culture and religion in Haiti, uh, Into the Silence, about the uh, one of the earliest attempts to, to summit Mount Everest. Um, he's a professor of anthropology at UBC. He's a Harvard-trained botanist, a filmmaker, He's a member of the Order of Canada. He's a one-time um, explorer in residence, which is one of my favorite titles, at the National Geographic Society in Washington. Um, he's also one of the world's great scholars uh, and defenders of indigenous peoples and cultures and languages. Uh, his travels have taken him to some of the farthest reaches of this planet, uh, from the Amazon rainforest to Borneo to northern Canada, um, and Wade and I, I'm happy to say, are colleagues as well at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, where he's brought incredible energy and thoughtfulness, uh, and his curiosity to his role as the Honorary Vice President of the Society. Um, and I am the host of Explore, which is a Canadian Geographic podcast, and we've just wrapped up our second season, and um, we'll be dropping this in, though, as a special addition to that. Um, and you can find us wherever you get your podcast, as they say. Uh, I'm also a journalist and a former cor foreign, no, foreign correspondent, excuse me. I spent uh, over 20 years reporting overseas uh, for CBC, CTV, NPR, PBS, uh, in places from Moscow to Beijing to Rome, Nairobi, uh, and I did a couple stints in Washington, D.C. Um, all which is to say, uh, this lockdown has made me feel very restless. Uh, not, not being able to travel, let alone not even be able to plan travel has been tough, which is why this book, uh, this book has uh, just been a godsend. Uh, I, I, I felt like reading this book, I was in these places and really discovering them for the first time. So it was a, a real blessing. Um, so Wade, I, I actually want to start off just asking you about the pandemic. And uh, as someone, you've spent basically your entire adult life on the road or planning to be on the road. And What's it been like these last six months for you? Well, well Dave, unlike you, I, I, you know, I, I've actually enjoyed it. Um, you know, it, I was poised on uh, March 3rd to begin a kind of marathon spring. I was going to be in seven countries traveling like you always did, you know, uh, 30 lectures, launching this book um, from Peru to Jordan. I was, you know, and it all, of course, like everybody's schedule, it went to the car wash overnight. And uh Oddly enough, I look back on that age of frenetic travel almost as a violent hallucination. You know, I think one yeah. of the things that will come yeah. out of COVID is is a uh, is sort of the you know we won't just dash off to the ball bearing manufacturers association meeting in Cleveland like we used to. You know, we you know I've actually been fortunate that my wife and I have been able to hunker down on a beautiful piece of land on Bowen Island right off the coast of BC. So mm -hmm. I you know. All the, all the, of course, tragedy aside and the, and, and, and the uh, horrific rates of morbidity and mortality and the suffering families, which obviously should be first in our minds. But just, you know, as a family, um, we've had a kind of an, uh, almost a summer vacation we hadn't anticipated, you know, mm. and it's, 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 um, it's changed my way of thinking about the nature of travel and, and uh and, and, and rekindle the kind of fidelity to, to place, you know, being able to actually watch a garden grow in the spring. And I planted an apple orchard. I mean, my, my life was as frenetic as yours. I mean, I've been at UBC for six years. There was not one single Thursday where I didn't fly off mm. somewhere to give a talk or something. And, uh, you know, I can't even remember the places I went to, but I remember the spring blooming on this small little bit of land. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how this 
pause basically which is what it is and as, as you say it's been there's a lot of tragedy tied to it but how this pause is going to affect our culture generally because i think it's going to change in ways that i think we don't even really understand yet um but let's talk about your book which is why you're here um uh so really this book feels like very much like a love letter and i think you almost say that at the beginning of it um to columbia and it's a it's a love affair for you that started quite early as a 14 year old boy uh we're in suburban montreal on a student exchange and just tell me about that that moment in those that period well you know it, it, my friend hector abad who's wrote the book oblivion and is one of columbia's great writers one of latin america's great writers you know hector um is famously and understandably embittered by the murder of his father which was one of the handful of assassinations in the modern history of columbia that truly shook an entire bloodstained nation and and he's known to have a kind of ambivalent he's such a beautiful man but an, a kind of ambivalent almost love hate thing about columbia which is understandable and so when he writes in the back of that book that you know only wade could make me love my country again and describes it as a love letter i was very touched by that because in a sense that's what the book is you know it um columbia was a was a nation that allowed me to dream uh, mm. as my Colombian's friend said, it gave me the wings to fly. Yeah. Um, my mother was a very um, um, uh, uh, humble but determined Canadian woman. And in 1968, she told me that Spanish was a language of the future. And she worked very hard as a secretary in an ele elementary school to earn the money to allow me to join a, a, a group of schoolboys that a teacher was bring, bringing to Cali, Colombia in the summer of 1968 at a time when, you know, Colombia was a long way away. We forget so easily yeah. that even as late as the 1970s, the vast majority of Canadians and indeed North Americans had never been in an airplane, let alone visited places like South America. And I was very fortunate because I was the youngest of the students and, and um, the only one who did not spend a sweltering summer in the streets of Cali with affluent families. I was with a more modest family who had a home in the mountains above the city mm. at the edge of trails that reached west to the Pacific. And many of the other Canadian lads, although older than me, uh, suffered from what the Colombians called mamitis, which is homesickness after eight weeks abroad. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, by contrast, felt like I had finally found home. It was sort of a classic Colombian scene, um, children too numerous to keep track of, an indulgent father, a, grandmother who muttered to herself on a porch overlooking uh, flower beds and fruit trees, uh, uh, an angelic sister who more than once carried me and my friend, her brother, home half drunk, uh, to a wonderful mother who would feign anger at the stone steps by the gate as she tapped her foot on the steps, you know, and, and welcomed us in, you know. I mean, it was just like, I, I felt like I found the warmth of a, of a people that enveloped one like a protective cloak, and at the same time, a people who in their intensity appreciated life, uh, and at the same time had an understanding for the frailty of the human spirit. You know, I kissed my first girl in Colombia. I got oh, wow. drunk for the first time. Yeah. I remember like, you know, uh, you know, you go to these cabalgatos with the hundreds of horses, and you'd come to some great fiesta, and you'd be dancing one moment with a girlfriend, whatever a girlfriend is when you're 14. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then the next moment with your mo her mother. And, you know, one thing you know, Dave, as a Canadian, we don't dance with our mothers, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it was just, it was like a life that uh, was a vision. And then, and then of course, you know, I returned there when I was um, 20 on a kind of journey of, 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 of coming of age, really. I, you know, I, I had connected with the great legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evans Schultes, mm -hmm. and I ostensibly went down to Columbia um, as a young botanist. And, and, I, and I worked ferociously hard as a plant explorer, but, uh, and I fell into the orbit of his protege, Timothy Plowman. So for a year and a half, Tim and I traveled together seeking the understanding of the botany and the uh, ethnobotany and, the, and the, um, uh, the origins of cultivated varieties of the plant known to the Inca as the divine leaf of immortality. And this, of course, was coca, oh, right. a notorious source of cocaine. And so, you know, I wrote a book about the, those journeys that was called One River. And what's it, it's kind of an interesting story of the nature and the power of books. Um, I basically gave away the Spanish rights to that book just to, so it would be available in Colombia. Right. And it came out in 2002 with the title El Rio, as opposed to One River. 
uh, and it had an addition of 500 copies. And, and in a country that at that time was virtually a failed state, mm -hmm. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't anticipate much, um, uh, uh, much reach for a book like that. But its great strength was the quality of the translation, translated by a beautiful poet, Nicholas Sesquan. And it was really his book more than mine at that point. And it, it gradually, by word of mouth, um, became like a map of dreams for two generations of young Colombians who weren't free to travel. And I think a great strength of it for the Colombians um, was the fact that, you know, it, it didn't speak about the war, it didn't speak about the drug trade, it revealed a portrait of a nation totally at odds with the dark cliches. And, and it became this almost beacon um, read not just by naturalists and anthropologists as you would expect, but by politicians and corporate figures and mothers and school children and even notorious figures like Fabio Ochoa, uh, one of the three members of the Ochoa brothers, one half of the Medellin cartel. Mm -hmm. And Marta, his uh, sister, called me up one night out of the blue asking me to visit Fabio in federal penitentiary in Georgia. Uh, he, because the book had meant so much to him. Wow. And in fact, the Colombian government on the eve of the 200th anniversary of the of the nation uh, selected one river, El Rio, as one of the um, the 25 of the first uh, 200 books to be selected as the most important books in the history of the country. And in part because of that book, I was made an honorary Colombian citizen um, by President uh, Juan ago, Manuel so. Santos just before he left office. So that one river is the Madalena. That is that. No, that one river was not. It was an account mm. of my travels in Colombia, mm. and and uh, uh, and and of course a biography of Schultes. But what mm. what what that book opened these doors is what I'm sort of yeah. saying. And, yeah. uh, and, um, and and one door that it opened is that it had inspired the CEO of Grupo Argos, which is one of the great corporate citizens of Colombia. And they had decided on their 100th anniversary not to celebrate themselves, but to celebrate the country. And they, um, they funded uh, teams of botanists and photographers to put together five beautiful illustrated books on each of the five major regions of Colombia, the Caribbean coast, the Andean Cordillera, the Eastern Plains or the Llanos, the Amazonian forest and the Western Pacific lowland forests of the Chilco. Mm -hmm. And these books were not to be sold, but be, to be gifted to every library in the country to send a message to a new generation of Colombians that theirs wasn't a country of violence and war, but it was a land of the greatest geographical and certainly biological and ecological diversity on the planet, home amongst other wonders to more species of birds than any other place. Right. And I was asked to come down to help sort of promote some of those books. And in the midst of one of our meetings, I sort of casually said, well, fellas, now that we've done the land, let's do the rivers. And that little casual statement became a kind of turning point because it prompted this project to do a, a biography of Colombia through the metaphor of the river that made possible the nation, the Magdalena, which in many ways is a Mississippi of, of, the, of the country. It's a quarter of commerce, but it's also the fountain of culture, the, the, the point of origin of poetry, prayer, literature, music. And so over the course of five years, I came to know that drainage, the Cuenca de la Magdalena, yeah. in all of its um, uh, aspects, in all seasons, in all times. And the book becomes really, um, in that sense, a love letter to the country. Talk, I mean, talk a bit more about the diversity of the country, because this, this river does run basically the entire length of it. And it what blows me away is just just the, the microclimates miles away yeah. from, you know. It's just, you know, one of the curious things is that when we think of the Spanish conquest, we think of Peru and Mexico. Yeah. And Colombia is almost dismissed as a sideshow. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, Pizarro simply had to walk across the beach to contact the Inca Tumbes right. in that fateful spring. Um, you know, the, the, the Quesada, who, who was one of the first to reach the land of the, Mus the Muisca, mm -hmm. had to fight through hell, uh, losing men by the day, just to get to the verdant uh, savanna of Bogota. Colombia would send more gold to spend Spain than either Mexico or Peru, and certainly, you know, precious stones by the sackful. Yeah. And the country's geography, dominated by the three great arms of the Cordillera, uh, uh, you know, the Cordillera Occidental, Central y, y Oriental that come out of the Colombian Macizo, this rugged knot of mountains that dominates southern Colombia, reaching north to the Caribbean coastal plain. 
uh, it, it's such a rugged topography that for most of its history, um, all commerce was on the back of a mule mm -hmm. along these trails of, you know, of the arrieros, the muleteers that brought all the goods. So even like Bogota, the capital, mm -hmm. at a time when it was being called the Athens of South America with great museums and libraries and the best universities, everything in that capital reached the heights of the savanna on the back of a mule carried from the Magdalena River. So the Magdalena was the one artery, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to this day, of course, it is, is a center of um, economy of the population. And it's a metaphor for the nation because in the same way that the, the nation turned its back on, on peace, it turned its back on the river and, and the river um, uh, for, became right. in a, literally the cemetery, the graveyard of a nation. Yeah. And there's this great overwhelming sense that in the wake of the peace agreement, um, wherever I went, the message was the same. We cannot cleanse our souls until we clean the river and we can't clean the river until we clean our souls. You know, you know, you know, let's just talk for a moment about this sort of violent country you've all heard about. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Colombia has endured extraordinary conflict, 50 years of war. Um, 220,000 dead, 100,000 dis, uh, disappeared, 7 million internally displaced, 5 million who by choice or obligation or coercion were forced to flee abroad. But during the entire conflict, um, there were never more than 220, no, 200,000 combatants in a country of 52 million people. The vast majority of Colombians were victims of a, of a three-way civil war that would not have lasted a day without the profits of cocaine. Right. Cocaine was the fuel of the fire of war. To put that in perspective, in the height of the Medellin cartel, the cartel budgeted $1,000 a week to buy elastic bands just to wrap the money in. Yeah, they incredible. weighed and, and yeah. measured money in hay bales. That was the only way. They were making $70 million a day. And even at the end, in the last year of the conflict, when the FARC, one of the two major leftist guerrilla groups was down to a mere 6,000 cadre, mostly teenagers uh, in search of three meals a day. They were still making $600 million from the cocaine trade. Now yeah. you give me the Ottawa Boy Scouts and $600 million and I can wreak havoc in Southern Ontario. Right. And so in this sense, I maintain that in a sense, we're all complicitous in, we all have the blood on Colombians on our hands. It's the use of cocaine. Can you imagine how, we, how the Americans would feel, Dave, if Canada had patterns of drug consumption, laws that facilitated an illicit market and lax uh, enforcement that made that market viable, yeah. that led to 85 million Americans having to flee their homes. Yeah. Well, that's what happened in Colombia. Most right. Colombians have never seen cocaine, let alone use cocaine. And yet the amazing thing about Colombia is despite that violence, yeah. uh, the country has maintained its civil society and democracy, greened its cities, created millions of acres of national parks, and sought restitution with indigenous people, First Nations, in a way that no nation, including Canada, can match. It does quiet things in a remarkable way. Consider how the Americans are treating the desperate mothers who arrive at their southern border, sent into exile by what? By, by political unrest that began with US foreign policy mm -hmm. in Central America in the 1980s and is being driven today by American consumption of cocaine, which is creating chaos throughout the delivery systems and the, and the and networks all through Mexico and Central America. Americans are more in favor of building a wall than they are of welcoming those desperate women with their children. Yeah. Colombia, by contrast, even while it was desperately trying to implement the expensive conditions of peace in the wake of the agreement, welcomed 1.4 million refugees in from Venezuela, not simply welcomed them, housed them, fed them, gave them medical care, uh, and sent their kids to school. And, and, and they did that even as oil prices plummeted. And oil, of course, is their greatest source of foreign revenue. Right. So Colombia, you know, is not only not a country of violence and war. It's a place of what I say, colores y cariño, colors and love. 
that only with, with a people with such a spirit could have endured such agonies. And I, and I can't stress the extent to which we have to recognize that, you know, we all are, um, in some sense, responsible. Yeah. Certainly everybody you know who has ever used illicit cocaine, I, I hate to be, and I'm not being melodramatic, does have the blood of Colombians on their hands, is responsible for the destruction of rainforests in the Northwest Amazon. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot to pick out in that. The, the, the history of Quesada himself and those early conquistadors, uh, I found, a, the poor Muisca people, because they not only had Quesada, they had two other groups coming in at them at the same time. In yeah. one of the one of the most curious things about the conquest, you had uh, Bela Quesada from the south and mm. Fetterman from the east and Quesada from the north, and they all kind of arrived on the savannah of Bogota, uh, and and they had a kind of a, a rapidly convened parley uh, to try to figure out what to do because they all wanted to lay lay claim to the land. And so this they was, all this was El Dorado to, in theory too, right? This well, was, uh, it was El Dorado. Yeah. It was literally El Dorado. That yeah. was that, that was that that was the 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 the, the origin of that myth, yeah. if you will, was yeah. in fact uh, Muisca. Yeah. And um, and so they all hastily sailed back to Spain to Charles V to ask his advice as to which one of them was to be uh, anointed the discoverer of a land the size of Belgium that was then home to a million Muisca people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the things I try to do in the book, you know, I, I, as a writer, I'm not into polemics. Uh, they're never persuasive. And whatever one thinks of the outcome of the Spanish conquest mm -hmm. or the or the or the the the, the obscene practices of the Spanish, uh, you cannot not admire the sheer grit and tenacity of these individuals who who managed to 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 conquer a, 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 con a, a continent, um, you know, and, and in all of their vain glory, most of them um, achieved very little and, yeah. uh, and, and lived and died lives of desperation. It just it struck me that there seemed to be a pretty straight line between the conquistadors and then the drug cartels, and that is just a violent get rich quick scheme, basically, right? I mean, well, where on earth does that not happen? I mean, yeah. I want to talk about get rich. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. When I when I came back from um, um, uh, Colombia, having worked with Tim, mm. uh, you know, the co coca is such a fa fascinating uh, example of our inability to understand and appreciate uh, the ways of indigenous people. I mean, coca is to cocaine what potatoes are to vodka. Right. To equate the two would be to equate the cyanic acid in a pit of a peach with the luscious fruit of a peach, but that's what we've done right. for 50 years. And efforts to eradicate the coca fields uh, in Peru and Bolivia in particular uh, began 50 or 60 years before there was an illicit cocaine problem. And the issue was never anything to do with the pharmacology of cocaine hydrochloride, everything to do with the cultural identity of the people who revered the plant as a divine leaf of immortality. And in the 1920s, when physicians in Lima, whose concern for the well-being of Indian people in the Andes was matched in its intensity only by their ignorance of Indian life, when they looked up in the Andes and they saw social pathologies, illiteracy, poor sanitation, they had to find a cause. And since issues of land distribution and economic justice uh, and inequities came too close to challenging the bourgeois foundations of their lives in Lima, they settled on coca as a culprit for everything. And the efforts to eradicate the fields began then. Uh, and the extraordinary thing is in all those years, none of those physicians bothered to do the obvious, a nutritional study of the plant to see what was in uh, something that was consumed every day by millions of, of indigenous people, six million of whom still spoke as their mother tongue, Quechua, the language of the Inca. And it wasn't until the mid seventies that Tim Plowman, Mike, colleague and mentor, mm -hmm. and Andrew Weil did the first nutritional study, and what they found horrified the backers of the USDA. Coca had a small amount of alkaloid, roughly analogous to the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean. Mm -hmm. But in addition to this small amount of alkaloid absorbed benignly as a mild stimulant through the mucous membrane of the mouth, the plant was full of vitamins. Uh, the, the daily consumption of coca was the daily requirement of vitamins for a human being. Mm -hmm. It had more calcium than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect 
for the dairy, a uh, 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 culture that lacked a dairy product. Uh, it, it was perfect for, uh, it had enzymes which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect for the potato diet of the Andes. So in one elegant assay that could have been done at any time, it was shown that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for 4,000 years. Now, at the end of those studies, there was a job opening at the USDA um, in Beltsville, where you know well. And uh, Tim said, I want you to apply for this job Willie, he called me Willie. Yeah. But if you apply, if you take the job, I'll kill you. Well, that was interesting. So I went out to Beltsville. The first thing I noticed, Dave, was that the guy wasn't USDA. He was DEA. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a drug addict. I couldn't get in the room for the cigarette smoke. Yeah. And he also had his entire walls covered with seized drug paraphernalia. It was like going to the hall of a, a room of an anti-pornographer and having penthouse pinups pin all over the walls. Right. And then I'm looking at this guy and the job in question is the only thing they've distilled from our two years of research is that Tim and I are good at finding coca fields. So he wanted me to go back down and infiltrate the fields, secure biological pests and bring them back so they could mess with them and mutate them and reintroduce them to even kill more coca plants. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? First of all, this has to be dangerous. And he reaches his big maul into his chest and pulls out a, a gold dog tag with his agents who have been murdered. And then I'm looking at this guy, it's a 1970s, big butterfly collar, hairy chest, gold chains, gold nuggets on his watch. And I'm thinking, where the hell have I met you before? And I'm just perplexed and, until I suddenly realize I've never literally met him before, but he is the cartel. When I was in Medellin, yeah. we lived down the road from Carlos Lee. People would come to our farm with briefcases full of cocaine. I, I always hated the drug and hated everything about it, even right. as I loved the coca leaf. And I realized in that instant that the cartels and the, the, the DEA were two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Neither one wanted to win the war on drugs. They'd yeah. be out of work. Yeah. And the, the Washington Post, as you may remember, because I think you were in D.C. then, mm -hmm. ran this really interesting investigative piece where they uh, they parsed where the thirty-eight trillion billion dollar anti-war anti-drug uh, budget went every year, and every piece of the American government had a pot, bit of that pie. Nobody wants to win the war on drugs. They'll all be out of work, right. and yet. The only thing that will really give Colombia a chance for peace, this is a, this remains the corrosive element, is the cocaine trade. And until nations uh, are realized that the the illicit nature itself is the problem, not the drug itself. Um, you know, there's no such thing as good and bad drugs. Cocaine hydrochloride remains our best topical anesthetic for nose, throat, and ear surgery. And mm -hmm. There are good and bad ways of using drugs, and snorting cocaine is a bad way of using that drug. Taking coca leaves is a great way of using that substance, if you will. But the main thing is if we want to bring peace to Colombia, we have to kill the cocaine trade. Otherwise, it will be always a thorn in the side of that nation, unjustly so. How is, so, I mean, we're now five years into a peace agreement there that seems to be holding and doing pretty well, and you've traveled all over the country in that time, yeah. I mean, how, how did, we, even if, as the cocaine trade rolls along, how is that peace, how did we reach that peace, and how is it being held? Well, I, th I think, you know, I think whenever a country is torn asunder, whether it's Ireland or whether it's South Africa or whether it's Colombia or indeed the United States, mm. peace and uh, reconciliation only comes when everybody's exhausted. Bottom you know, there was a, yeah. there was a, a social media campaign started on Facebook with two young Colombian kids just saying, no mas FARC, no more FARC. Right. And within a month, they had 2 million people in the streets of Bogota. So two, two presidents, um, uh, Alvaro Uribe of the right and Juan Manuel Santos, who had been his defense minister, but then when he ran for president, turned his energy toward peace um, and they became bitter antagonists in, 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 uh, be, in as a consequence but it's actually both men who made possible the peace in the sense that Uribe because he was associated with the paramilitaries a little bit like Nixon going to China was the one man in 2006 who could at least formally demilitarize the paras. The paracos right. are still there yeah. but they're not an open marauding force as they were before 20, 2006. And to bring them in out of the cold, 
he had to give them lenient terms. By the same token, President Santos, to bring the FARC out of the mountains, had to give them lenient terms in Havana. Both men have been pilloried for doing so, but there was no other option save perpetual war. Again, because of the fuel of cocaine and what I said about the amount of money being generated. And, and when Santos signed the agreement, there was euphoria in the country, but there was still this, this bitterness um, and a sense that the FARC had gotten off too lightly. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly exploited uh, by the right to split the presidential field. And it led to the election of President Duque. Uh, who was a protege of Uribe. Mm -hmm. And even though within a year of the peace agreement, homicide rates in Colombia had plummeted to rates not seen since 1975, before the wars, um, there was still this, this, this threat to dismantle the peace agreement. And the problem is the peace agreement had hundreds of clauses that were, and the cost of that was to be about $48 billion to implement. Right. And that happened just when the oil collapsed, just when the Venezuelan refugee crisis. And so one of the problems was that as the FARC demilitarized and as they abandoned vast geographical reaches of the country that they controlled, the federal state didn't get in there with power and presence rapidly enough. Meanwhile, civil society came up and said, well, we want the conditions of peace to be enforced and we cry out for it. And into, the, into that void went the... Um, disillusioned FARC, the renegade FARC, the, the, the drug dealers, the, the cartels, uh, and, and they then began to kill individuals. And so since the agreement, there have been um, a, a, a terrible number, 500 or more civic leaders killed by the, by, by the, by the criminal element. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and, and this has created a, a great deal of disappointment, disillusionment. Um, but at the same time, the country is so exhausted by war, it will never go back to what it was. And uh, uh, aside from these incidents, the overall violence in Colombia has completely plummeted. It's a safe to travel there. In fact, the only danger of going to Colombia today is that you won't ever want to come back because it's so yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I've been planning my trip as I read the book. Um, and I want to get to some of the more lyrical parts of um, the Madalena and Colombia as well. And on the one hand, people know Colombia for all these headlines we've talked about. On the other hand, it's Gabriel Garcia Marquez is probably the most famous export, right? Nobel laureate and amazing novels. And magical realism is he's the, the great proponent of it. And you had a line in there where you said, you know, he was a working journalist his most basically his entire yeah, life, right? Yeah. And and for him, magical realism in Colombia was journalism. It was just the, right. what he saw yeah, around yeah, him. I mean, and can you explain that? Well, you know, it's hard to explain until you're there. You know, one of the people, you know, I was just talking to someone, you know, when, when, when someone asked me, you know, why do you go to India? Well, I could say, why do you go to the Serengeti? You know, why do you go to Botswana? Why do you mm. go to Paris? Well, you go, you can name the sites, you can money. Colombia has points of wonder. Uh, the entire country is wondrous in terms of yeah. its beauty. It does have great national parks, probably the most extensive system in, in Latin America. It, it has a vibrant cultural diversity. 85% of Colombians declare themselves to have no particular ethnicity, which speaks of the coherence and the solidarity of the nation. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that the indigenous voices are still there to inform. They're still there. And one of the great uh, consequences and benefits of, of, of the war, if there is one, is that vast areas of Colombia were left alone. So, mm. uh, so, for example, Eastern Ecuador made decisions about its future in the 1970s that led to the real violation of the Oriente, you know, with, with pipelines and oil exploitation and colonization. Mm -hmm. And the Colombian Amazon, though now threatened, uh, is not only the most beautiful part of the entire Amazon basin, uh, it is today essentially roadless and it's the size nearly of France. So Colombia is in this fantastic position. Right. It's had a reprieve from history uh, and it's been isolated and insulated from the development pressures that have swept the world over the last half century mm -hmm. and now it's able to make decisions as it indeed is um, informed by 50 years of science and appreciation of biodiversity of cultural diversity that simply didn't exist 50 years ago when the fate of countries like 
Brazil and to some extent, uh, certainly Ecuador w w was decided. So Colombia is on the, on the eve of a renaissance. Don't forget, you also have two generations of young Colombians uh, forced to flee the country who are coming back from every capital in the world with skill sets and every conceivable endeavor, setting the, 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 the scene for a kind of economic and, and cultural renaissance unlike ever, anything ever experienced in Latin America. It is, after all, the nation with the greatest universities. It speaks a fine Spanish. It, 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 is, it is, you know, it, it, it's in a league kind of its own. And it's because of the people. And that wonderful line um, by, by Gabo, you know, um, the, the, the magical realism is just journalism in Colombia. You know, I mean, it, it's like uh, uh, people seek reassurance in the phantasmagoric. Um, the, the, you know, it, you know it, it, Gabo wrote the way he did because he lived in a land where heaven and earth just happened to, to merge on a regular basis to reveal mm -hmm. glimpses of the divine. Um, you know, Colombia is a place where magic seems to happen every moment. And I would argue that only a people like the Colombians yeah. with their enduring spirit of place, their, their, their indescribable capacity for joy yeah. um, could have endured the agonies of the last 50 years. I, 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 don't I was know struck by your description of, uh, of San Augustine and just in talking about magical places and, and places that again, nobody, have, I don't think really heard of. And it's, way older than Machu Picchu. You know, it's funny instance. because, you know, like, we, you know, you say Peru, Machu Picchu, you say, yeah. you know, you say, uh, you know, uh, Guatemala, Tikal or whatever. Um, you know, Colombia has these places, but again, in this kind of curious way, they weren't discovered for the longest time. I mean, the lost city of the, of the Tirona uh, in the Sierra Nava, uh, Navarra de Santa Marta in Colombia, um, in, on the coastal plain, the highest coastal mountain range on earth, uh, was not discovered by waqueros, by grave robbers until the mid 70s. And it was only worked by archeologists a couple years later. San Agustin, which is probably the greatest uh, uh, pre columbian civilization or, or, or archeological site uh, in Colombia was bypassed by Quesada in his obsession for El Dorado as he marched north from Quito toward the Muisca, uh, where Bogota is today. And it wasn't really discovered until 222 years later when a priest stumbled upon these extraordinary, uh, massive uh, 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 statues, uh, yeah. with these anthropomorphic figures and everything that is spread over a thousand square kilometers at the headwaters of the Rio Magdalena. You know, I mean, you know, the, in Colombia, think about this, there is no place in Colombia more than one day removed from every known ecological niche yeah found on the planet yeah, you know it is a land of utter superlatives and you still have for example um you know i i i've spent a lot of time with the arawakos and mm. and the kogi the elder brothers in the sierra nevada these are the descendants of the ancient tyrone civilization who in the wake of the conquest fled into this isolated massif where they virtually were unknown for a couple hundred years uh, and they in a bloodstained continent they remain ruled to this day by a ritual priesthood and, and the training for the priesthood is arduous in the extreme and they actually believe that their prayers and rituals maintain the cosmic balance of the world. Mm. And uh, it's amazing to think that these sun priests, uh, direct descendants of the Tyrona, um, the, the, the vision in a sense of pre-Columbian America are alive and well today, staring down at the very sands of the beaches where Columbus's men landed on the third voyage in 1499, not two hours by plane from Miami Beach, mm -hmm. praying to this day every day for our collective well-being. And they make ritual payments at the mouth of the Magdalena. And traditionally, they embarked on pilgrimages a thousand miles up the river, and they would measure the consciousness of every people by the way the river was treated. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they don't distinguish the water in a river from the blood and the veins of a human being. Hmm. And they would reach the very heights of the Macizo in the south, the Laguna de la Magdalena, the headwaters, and make these ritual prayers. And, you know, it, it, it's extraordinary to think that in this modern nation of Colombia, the indigenous voices are still with us. You know, in 1985, an incredible Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, um, um, uh, said to my friend Martin von Hildebrand, a young anthropologist and an acolyte of Reichel Domatov, Schulte's great 
friend um, and colleague, he said, do something for the Indians. And in five extraordinary years as head of Indian affairs, Martin did more than something. He secured legal land tenure to, for 57 ethnicities in 162 resguardos that collectively are the size of the United Kingdom, protected land rights in an area the size of the United Kingdom, encoded in the 1991 constitution in perpetuity mm -hmm. for the indigenous people. And behind that veil of isolation, a whole new dream of culture was reborn. Wow. In the 1970s, when I'd be going off to see the mamos of the, of the elder brother, uh, my friend's parents would say, Por qué quiere vivir con la gente sucia? Why do you want to live with the dirty people? Now the last five Colombian presidents as a first act of office before even taking on the mantle of the presidency at their inaugurations, they have gone to the mountains to pay homage to the mamos who have emerged as a symbol of patrimony and continuity in a, case, in a nation that's been so what, torn asunder by, by what, the What's drugs. the lesson there for Canada? Well, the lesson for Canada, I suppose, is is that um, it is possible to seek restitution with the First Nations, uh, that that Indigenous people are not an embarrassment to the nation state, they're an asset to it if the state's prepared to accept diversity. And I think Canada is. I mean, I think we've gone, we've, we, you know, Canada and Colombia, I would say, are the two nations to their immense credit, and, and neither one is perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in neither country do First Nations live as they ought to be able to live. Uh, but, but compared to how Indigenous people were treated in both Canada and uh, Colombia in the lifetime of my father, uh, the, the nations and, and, and have taken great strides. And in general, the people of both countries are highly supportive of these initiatives, which says a lot about the two nations. Um, you spent a lot of time on foot in this book, it sounds like, especially in the high country walking. And I'm just wondering how important that is for you as someone researching a book or writing a book or learning about a people being on foot. Well, I, you know, I, um, one of the things that I, um, you know, Levi Strauss called travel books, grocery lists and lost dog stories. Right. And one of the things I try, you know, very hard is to me, you know, a, a travel log built around self is sort of like the false uh, exploits of the of, of, of phony explorers. You know, I, I really try not to have myself in a book, you know, I actually have a kind of a test how many times do, do I use the word I mm. in a book? And outside of the preface where that word, you, it's kind of hard to avoid it. But in this book, which is now, I don't know, what is it, 400 pages? Uh, the use of the word I appears only 143 times in 400 pages. And that, to me, that that is the goal of, of travel writing is mm -hmm. to not even be there. You know, the, the reader should know that you couldn't not have been there. Otherwise, you couldn't describe the place with the sensitivity and depth mm -hmm. that you are. But, you know, no one needs to know what I ate for breakfast, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I hear you. I really try to cultivate that. And, and, and I think it's a really great um, um, lesson for young writers. If you are interested in writing uh, journalistically or, or essays or, or um, your first book, uh, and, it, and, it, and it is driven by a first personal account of which there's no problem whatsoever. It's a great literary genre. But just watch the use of the word I. And the minute you're using the word I, you're getting lazy. You arm yourselves with great traveling companions all through this book, though, too. It seems to be a, a real well, you know, they, of... Yeah, I mean, this, this book is not about me. You know, I mean, one of the things I, you know, I mean, there are a lot of ways of writing books about a river. I was never tempted to paddle the... Magdalena from source to mouth, or even to travel it in a single go by hitchhiking rides on barges and riverboats. I, I had no interest whatsoever in building a narrative around self. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to tell a bio, I wanted to write a biography of a nation through the metaphor of a river. And the subtitle in the Spanish edition is not Rivers of River of Dreams, it's Historias de Colombia, Stories of Colombia. Right. I, I saw myself in a way as a stenographer. A, a good friend of mine I traveled with, Juancito uh, uh, Betancourt, a fantastic, brave journalist, uh, mm -hmm. now a professor at AFIT in Medellin, one of the great universities. Uh, Juancito had a great, he wrote a book, a great book himself on the Magdalena. And uh, he had this great field methodology. He took a sabbatical and he just would turn up in any village along the entire length of the river. And he'd just sit there until he met a character who, 
who had something to say the world needed to hear, which for him, as for Hemingway, was the essence of storytelling. It was kind of like uh, sociology inspired by serendipity. Until he mm -hmm. found that person, uh, he would s stay put. Yeah. And in a way, this book is not my book. It's a, it's a, it's a book of, of the people that I, I came to know. Um, uh, and it's their voices, their experiences. And, you know, there's an epic quality to to uh, to what they had to say. I mean, this is my friend. Let me just read you mm -hmm. um, a, a friend of mine, Herman Ferro, who's the head of the Museum of the Magdalena in Onda. And he, and, and he said to me, you know, to clean up the river would be to wash the soul of the nation. This is yeah, a constant it's, refrain. It's incredible, yeah. And, and he said, I'll never forget the moment when I first heard that peace – that the peace agreement had been signed in Havana. By chance, I was at the very confluence of the Rio Calca and the Magdalena. The Calca is the other great arm of the drainage. I was completely overwhelmed by what I can only call geographical emotion, a sense of space, as if the spirits were emerging from the earth. I stripped off my clothes and placed my head in the river. As I stood in the sun, the water dripping down my naked body, I began to weep. Mm -hmm. Rivers of tears flowed as I realized that my son could grow up in a country at peace. A river that has known every tragedy, that has carried the dead and all the misery of the nation, that has suffered along with all Colombians, a river that I love so much, and there we were by its waters as peace came over the land. That's how Colombians think and speak and feel. They've all seen there is no... There is no Colombian who hasn't suffered. You know, there's a Max Hastings tells a wonderful story of being in mm -hmm. Moscow after World War II, and uh, uh, you know, and and you know, someone would say, "Well, my my uncle uh, was sent away to that gulag," and then someone else would say, "Oh, my aunt went there too," as if as if they discovered that their relatives had gone <laughs> to the same school. Yeah. Colombia is like that. You'll be at a you'll be at a dinner in Bogota at a fancy restaurant, and someone say. Well, my, my, my grandfather was actually killed by the FARC up on, you know, up in uh, uh, Kachaka or whatever, you know. Oh, my uncle died there too. And, and it's like it's a state of nature. I mean, it, it, it's so powerful. And my friend Sandor Uribe, who um, is a major character in the book and was mm -hmm. my, I mean, the only reason her name isn't on the cover of the book is the fact that I wrote it and, and the conventions of publishing. But she is a young girl when she could not, uh, tell the sound of thunder from the sound of bombs. That's when she was sent to Miami to live with her grandmother. She yeah. was made fun of for being from the land of Pablo Escobar by uh, American teenage high school students whose main social activity was seeking drugs, with cocaine right. being their right. drug of choice. Sandra had never seen cocaine, yeah. let alone used it. I mean, they, 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 these are small stories. Uh, um, now, there's an incredible um, point where she's describing, I think it was her being with her family, and in the evenings they turn on the radio just to learn where the latest bomb blast was. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, you know, just mean, to find and, out how and, close you know, it was to home. Were nearly killed by a bomb. A bomb blew in their home. And they were just one random family yeah. uh, in Medellin during yeah. the worst of the troubles. And now... You know, the other thing about the book is it's also a book of redemption and hope. Now Medellin's yeah. a garden city again. Yeah. Uh, and it was saved by the deliberate determination of the people who brought in specific mechanisms of urban planning and new architecture that made everybody feel part of the whole. I mean, Columbia, Columbia's story of survival is a story of redemption, regeneration, and, and hope. And it's all infused to the rhythm of cumbia and music. There's a lot in the book about music and i was able to hang out with uh you know um oh, carlos yeah. vilas the great the great uh, rock star really you know yeah. and he's also a great ethnomusicologist and you know carlos speaks about the river as being the fountain of every note of every genre of music and of course colombian music is the music of the world the most top 100 youtubes in the world yeah. oh. uh, today 85 of them are music videos, and of those, fully 10 or 12 are Colombian music. So yeah. Colombian music has become the heartbeat of the world. So my one complaint about your book, Wade, is that your two chapters on Colombian music, which I loved, came about 250 pages in, so I didn't start listening to it until the last 100 pages of the book, which I did all the way through. <laughs> but wonderful, like Cumbia and um, with the other, the... Uh, well, uh, uh, tambora, 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 and, yeah, and yeah. you know, merengue, and you know, salsa. I mean, salsa, 
originate in the Caribbean, but it came into Colombia, and what they spat back was something yeah. altogether different. I mean, you, you can, have it, you described it as a, a country of a thousand rhythms, and and then you actually had someone who says it's been quantified. There's a yeah, thousand and twenty five or something. <laughs> It's you know, incredible. Here's, here's the danger in Colombia. You know, if anything happens, a landslide or a derailment or a little a choke, a little car accident, everybody piles out. Or if you're, or if a plane's late in the airport, right? Mm. And you're just sort of hoping to get on that plane. Don't hold your breath because if you begin to see the feet of the women turn tightly and the skirts spin and whirl yeah. and yeah. you hear the rhythms of cumbia, you better get a, get make new plans for the night because you're going to be there because it's, <laughs> life is a party, you know? Yeah. And, and um, you know, I, 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 I honestly believe that only a people with such a spirit of place could have endured as they have. Yeah. Um, and so as one of, one of the, um, a med uh, friend of mine, one of the voting villages in the great, Cienega de Santa Marta, the Grande de Santa Marta, mm -hmm. this fantastic floating fishing village where the uh, dogs are afraid of water and the cats swim. <laughs> he said to me, and they had endured one of the worst massacres. In so that's magical realism right there, though, Wade, I think, too. Yeah, <laughs> he said, we have, we, we have peace. Colombia is beautiful. Come and see her. You know, we are waiting for you. Yeah. And I would urge everybody um, to, to put Colombia on their uh, itinerary. Yeah, that's great. I have one last question. It, I mean, it's a country that's had massive divisions. And I feel like we're in a period in the West where we're going through a lot of division, obviously. And I'm just wondering, are there lessons to be learned from Colombia? Is it, is it, is it more than just having to bottom out first? Is there things we can learn from what they've done? I, I think there is, when, when, when divisions become so acute that they become pathological, uh, certainly the Irish situation was like that. South Africa was pathological. Uh, um, um, uh, Colombia was pathological. The United States right now is pathological. I think the only hope is a bottoming out, a kind of a collective exhaustion of always the vast majority who have nothing to do with the pathology right. and simply want to live their lives. You know, let, I'll, I'll end with a beautiful um, a story that isn't really about Colombia, but um, I was flying back from Nairobi to, uh, to Paris once, mm -hmm. and I was in the... Um, business class lounge at Charles de Gaulle and it was four o'clock in the morning and I've been living with the Rindili so I smelt like camel dung and, and, and camel <laughs> blood and I was there was no shower and I was trying to figure out how I could get my body into that little basin you know yeah. and suddenly this very elegant African man walks in right beside me and begins to strip off his clothes and I thought well geez if he can do it I can do it so I strip off my clothes we've got these two bird baths going and I suddenly look in the mirror and I said wait a minute you, you you're not Archbishop Tutu, are you? No. And he goes, no, no, everybody's always confusing me with that guy. It just gets a little bit tiresome and so on. You know, I don't. And I went back to my bird bath and then in my inimitable Irish Canadian way, I kept blabbing on. I said, oh, I'm just so sorry to bother you in the middle of the night, sir, but just what a man he was, what a symbol of hope and what he did with Mandela and how that country came out of that and without bloodshed. And when I went on and on waxing eloquent about the wonder of this amazing man. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I looked up in the mirror and I said, wait a minute, you are Archbishop Tutu. And then he had a big, that big smile of his yeah. and he said the most beautiful thing. He said, son, and you know what? We couldn't have done it without you. And he didn't mean me personally. He meant the goodwill of the world that supported right. South Africa and its struggles. And I would end this conversation day by saying, you know, Columbia deserves our help, our love, our affection, our investments, our, our gratitude, um, um, at the sheer uh, achievement of surviving these 50 years of violence, drug and fuel, fueled as they have been. And, um, you know, what ultimately will, will bring all divided countries together at some level is decent human decency, love, compassion, and the good will of all good people of the world. And that's why this book is a love letter to Columbia. And, 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 it's, it, and it's, it asks everybody um, to, to give to Columbia what Columbia deserves, um, uh, uh, a, another chance to realize its destiny. Well, Wade, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this book in this country, which is sounds like a remarkable place. It's Madalena, a river of dreams, and I would highly recommend it. I personally now want to travel to Colombia, so it, it had its effect on me that way. So thank you. Thank Wade. you very much, Dave. Yeah, I really enjoyed this.